Hey everybody, it's so great to see you here today at TwilioCon, uh, and thank you for getting up early to be here. We really appreciate it. You know, just four years ago, Evan, John, and I launched Twilio, and we did it because we wanted to put communications into the hands of the world's software people. But why did we want to do this? It's a question we were often asked. People gave us advice. They said, don't build APIs, build an application. And if people use your application, then you've earned the right to add APIs to it. And other people said, don't sell to developers. Developers, they don't buy anything, right? Uh, and so we got a lot of advice that said to do it a different way. But you know what? We built Twilio the way we did it because of who we are. See, we are software people. This is our background. And my background is before starting Twilio, I was at Amazon Web Services. But before that, I had started three other companies. My most recent company was a bricks and mortar retailer. And we had this idea. We wanted a smart phone line so that when customers called the stores, we knew who they were. We could look up their recent orders. We could look up if they had special orders or repairs in our shop. And we could completely tailor the experience of calling our stores to who the customer was. Before that, I was the first CTO of StubHub.com. And there, we were letting buyers buy a live event ticket online. And the ticket would be delivered just in time for the event, within half an hour in their hands, be delivered by a courier. And so we wanted to use communications to facilitate getting a courier to go pick up a ticket from a seller and deliver it to a buyer in real time and create that magical experience. That's what we wanted to do. But you know what? We started looking around, and we started talking to, to companies who could help us do this. We started talking to vendors. And what we found is that what they were selling wasn't designed for software people. What they were selling were monolithic software packages. It does what it does. It does what they designed it to do. It's big software with big, big price tags and big implementation timelines and they're not very flexible. APIs are virtually unheard of. You know, unless you wanted to, to sign an 80-page NDA or take a certification training course. No, they didn't trust software people. This monolithic software, they wanted it to be used the way they intended it, and it was a blunt instrument, not designed to be bent and customized and changed the way software people want to do when you have an idea and you want to make it a reality. It's like trying to paint the Mona Lisa when all you have as your tool is a roller. It's like they're selling you a big black box with a, a, with a do not open, we'll void your warranty sticker across it. But that doesn't make any sense to software people. We want to open the box and we want to create things. So we started Twilio the way we did because I believe in software people. All you have to do if you are a software person is identify a problem, get into that software mindset, and solve that problem with software. This is why Mark Andreessen says software is eating the world. And you know what? He's right. We are software people. We're creating this stuff. We're building the future every day. And every day, more and more problems are coming into the domain of software. And we can now solve these problems. And in the last four years since we launched Twilio, you people have shown us what is possible. And we're truly amazed. But in 2012, it's interesting, the role of software people is more important than ever. Why? Because software people create experiences. And customer experience is becoming all that matters. In fact, Harley Manning of Forrester Research says, the only source of competitive advantage is the one that can survive a technology-fueled disruption, an obsession with customer experience. And you know what? You cannot serve customers, and you cannot create those experiences if you are tied to aging infrastructure that's costly to upgrade, that's nearly impossible to integrate, you don't have the tools, you've got a roller. And what you end up with are silos. Silos of software that don't talk to each other. And silos that separate you from the customer you're trying to serve 
and the experience you're trying to create. You know, we've all had this experience where we call a company and we talk to the automated system and it says, what's your account number? And what's your mom's maiden name? And what's your, what's your dog's maiden name? And you answer all these questions only to reach a live person and the first thing they ask you is, what's your account number? Right, this is silos at work, these systems that are monoliths that don't talk to each other. But you know what? User expectations have changed. People will not put up with this anymore. So whether your company is building for a consumer, whether you're building software for a business, or whether you are in the enterprise, user expectations have changed. Because of a funny thing, when we go home, we work with great tools. We have Gmail, we've got iPhones, we've got iPads, we have Facebook. These things are magical. And as consumers, we adopt them and we buy them because they solve a problem for us, because they make our lives better. That's why we use these things. But then you go to work, and you're building, or you're using the tools your work gives you, and you've got this aging software sitting in a phone closet somewhere, sitting in a data center. And it's not dynamic, and it's not integrated, and it doesn't work on your iPhone. And your mail server at work deletes all your email when you go over 50 megabytes in your inbox, right? This is far from magical. It's because in the business world, upgrade cycles are measured in decades, and in the consumer world, you get a new iPhone every two years. And so consumer is leapfrogging B2B and enterprise software and resetting our expectations. But this is where the cloud comes in. See, I believe in software, and I believe in software people. But I also believe in the cloud and cloud software. See, the cloud is the best platform that we as software people have ever had to realize our ideas. Because the cloud lets us focus on the user. And that's what is so important. The cloud lets us focus on the user. First of all, it does that because it frees us up from the bits. You know, we've got infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. We've got great tools that let us as software people get straight to the value proposition that we're trying to solve for our customers. Forget those bits. They are table stakes. The playing field has been leveled. Everybody has that. It's all about focusing on the user. But the cloud not only helps us to focus on the user, it also forces us to focus on the user. Because what makes the cloud great that it's so easy to build and so easy to discover and to buy and to iterate also makes it hyper competitive. Our solutions, they have to be mobile, they have to be integrated, and they have to be easy to use because another solution is just a few clicks away on Google. So when we have choices, when we're free to choose our software, we make rational decisions. We choose the best experience. We choose the thing that solves our problem, and we're pretty good at figuring that out. We choose the thing that's the right price that actually makes our lives better. And because of this, opportunities lie with you, with software people who can build those great experiences. That's why I believe in the cloud. Quite simply, because it's gonna win. It has to win because it's focused on the user. Plain and simple. You know, cloud isn't just a buzzword. You know, some people say, oh, the cloud, that's just, that's just the internet, right, with a new word. But, you know, it's not just marketing. It's not just the internet, like marketing websites. And it's not just simplistic web applications that we saw maybe a decade ago. No, the cloud is our rebuilding from the ground up all of the software we use to run our lives and run our businesses and rebuilding it in a way that lives and thrives online, in an online connected world. You know what? It's not just throwing that old software, those silos, those monoliths. It's not just throwing those onto a server, a host somewhere on the internet, and calling that the cloud. It's building multi-tenancy in from the ground up so that it scales horizontally, so it's elastic, so that we have these experiences like we do on Gmail and Facebook. And the days of upgrades are gone. The cloud gets better every single day. 
The cloud is learning from the world of consumer where people have choices and we're applying that learning to the world of business. So upgrades, silos, building out data centers, these things are all noise. In 2012, you don't get any brownie points for having servers. You get brownie points for serving users. That is the essence of the cloud, period. End of story. We are software people, and in the cloud, we will focus on the user. But you know what's funny? The world of communications isn't like this. It comes from a legacy of hardware and a legacy of fiber optics and copper and machines sitting in a phone closet because that is the history of telecom. And people making software in telecom are focused on protocols and codecs and low-level bits. And 80% of the engineering of legacy telecom goes into, can this thing make a phone call? Can it connect to the DS3? Can it connect to the network? Can it make a phone ring? And 20%, the afterthought is spent on the user experience. But now, all of that is table stakes. In telecom, the field has been leveled. With cloud communications, this is all now a software problem. It is purely in the domain of software. While legacy people are focused on infrastructure, you are focused on the user. You invert that ratio, you take that 80% of your time, and you're focused on the user instead of on the scaffolding. And this matters because you're building in the cloud age where the user is all that matters. You're providing software that gets better every day, and you're building on infrastructure that's getting better every day instead of depreciating in a phone closet. So against those competitors that you have, against other people who are shackled to big hardware and big software, you are going to run circles around them because this is where you as software people shine. You find a need and you solve it. And communications is now firmly in the domain of software. And so you can find these problems and you can solve them. Companies big and small are building things to tackle these kinds of problems. You're tackling multi-billion dollar industries, challenging those monoliths and breaking down those silos. You're building call centers that know who you are when you call because they integrate with lightweight CRM APIs in the cloud. You're building parking meters that text you when your parking expires. You're building new business models for taking leads online and converting them into a sale on the phone. And you are getting out the vote in underserved populations. You are doing all these things that we never dreamed of when we started Twilio. Because we are software people. We are the army of ones and zeros. We are software people. And that's why we made Twilio the way we did. We made it easy to learn. We made it accessible to anybody. And we made it powerful to scale when your ideas have legs. Communications is now in the domain of software. Because we are software people. And we focus on the user. And we will win. That's the world of software people that we are all a part of. And I'm really proud. So we've got a phrase for software people in our community. We call them doers. You'll see the word doer uh, all over uh, TulioCon. Because these are people, you guys, who pick up tools and build great things and solve problems. And we are lucky enough to get to work with a whole lot of doers. Let's meet a few of them. First up, Faye Anderson. Faye built the Voter ID app as a part of the Cost of Freedom project. It provides real-time SMS access to voter ID information across the country so that anybody can text a phone number and learn about voter ID laws in that person's state to make sure that they can have their voice heard come November. And what's really cool, she integrated it with Google Docs so that anybody uh, who is contributing to the project could go in and update voter ID information online very easily. Let's hear it for Faye and the voter ID app. <laughs> Next up, Brett and David Koff. 
They built Remind 101. They had an aha moment when they were undergrads at Michigan State, and they wanted to communicate better with their teacher, but their teacher wouldn't give them the cell phone number, right? It makes sense. So what they built was a simple and easy way for teachers to communicate with their students and with parents. K through 12, all the way through college, any teacher can now safely and securely communicate with their students and with, teacher, with their uh, students and the families without revealing their own phone number and having all that communications tracked. Very cool. Let's hear it for Brett and David and Remind 101. <laughs> Next up, we've got Prashat Singh and Emily Wright Moore from Code for America. Prashat built Text My Bus in conjunction with the city of Detroit. It provides real-time SMS information for public transit riders, so that anybody can text an intersection where they're at and find out where the nearest bus stop is and find out when the next bus is, arri uh, uh, next bus is arriving. And what's really cool is it's live in Detroit as of September, and it's open source so that any city can adopt it. And Emily built Preparedly with the city of Austin. What Preparedly does is it helps people prepare for wildfires by integrating with the National Weather Service to find out if it's a high-risk day, and then texting citizens what they can do to prevent wildfires during those alert seasons. And she open-sourced it. So let's hear it for Emily and Prashant of Code for America. <laughs> Next up, Seth Bannon of Amicus. He built a fundraising platform for social good, and it integrates with social networks so volunteers who are passionate about causes can call their friends, and call their friends of friends to raise money. In fact, earlier this year, a single nonprofit in Wisconsin generated, generated over 10,000 phone calls using Amicus in a 24-hour period. Let's hear it for Seth and Amicus. <laughs> Next up, Tiago Peva. He's building a company called TalkDesk that lets you create a call center in your browser in under five minutes and it integrates with Salesforce and Zendesk and HiRise and Desk.com and just about anything else you can imagine. In fact, last year at TwilioCon, Tiago won the Twilio Fund Challenge and got funding for his idea, and today he's racking up clients, and one of his most recent clients is Chevrolet. Let's hear it for Tiago and TalkDesk. <laughs> Next up, Ash Rust. He's building a company called SendHub. SendHub makes it easy and fast, for business people to communicate and SMBs to communicate with their customers via group text message. They've got tens of thousands of users just months after they launched, and they're sending millions of messages a month. They went through Y Combinator earlier this year, and after leaving Y Combinator, they just closed a round of $2 million, Ash tells us. So let's hear it for Ash and send home. <laughs> Next up, Kunal Batra. He built Deftel. So DefTel replaces traditional TTY, teletype devices, that deaf people use to communicate with the hearing. And these are expensive devices that plug into the phone network, and they use live human operators to translate between the TTY and the hearing person on the other end. But Kunal had a better idea. He turned it into an iPhone app and replaced the hardware and replaced the human operators with an app that anyone can go download from the App Store. Let's hear it for Kunal and DefTel. Next up, Pete Moore. He's building Ninja Blocks. Ninja Blocks bridges the world of the physical to the digital. They're tiny computers that you can throw anywhere, and they've got sensors and actuators and network connectivity, and so you can do really cool things like turn the lights on in your home via a text message, or get an alert when the water level is rising in your basement. They can do anything because they're programmable and they bridge the digital and analog worlds. In March, they tried to raise $24,000 on Kickstarter. Instead, they raised over $100,000. Let's hear it for Pete and NinjaBox. <laughs> Next up, Tony Webster created HeroJobs.org. Tony answered a lightning challenge from the then CTO of the United States, Anish Chopra. Anish had just launched an API that gives access to uh, jobs for veterans across the United States. And he issued a challenge. He said, I want someone to make this information accessible to veterans on the go. Tony answered that challenge. And in just six hours, he built a way for people to sign up for text alerts every day to be notified of new jobs that fit the veteran skill set in their area. And as a result, he got to meet Dr. Jill Biden earlier this year. Let's hear it for Tony and Hero Jobs. 
Next up, Tess Rinderson and Drew Inglis. They built Activist.io. Uh, activist they started this at the Pen Apps Hackathon earlier this year. It's a widget that you can drop onto any web page that lets your visitors call Congress and advocate for causes. They built it because of SOPA and PIPA, and in the first week after launch, they had over 170,000 visitors using the app. And they were a part of, the, uh, part of the instrumental effort that defeated SOPA and PIPA earlier this year. Let's hear it for Tess and Drew and Activist.io. <laughs> Next up, Daniel Palacio. He's building a company called Authy. Authy makes it easy for anyone to add two-factor authentication to their web or mobile apps. So when you try to log in, it'll send you a text message with a pin that you have to enter. And it makes apps more secure in this age of insecurity. He's got customers worldwide. And he reports that just months after launching, they are growing at 100% month over month. Let's hear it for Daniel and Afi. <laughs> and last up, Kirill Savino. He's building Game Changer Media. Game Changer is a mobile app that lets fans of amateur sports at events keep track of all the stats that are going on during the game and then text out those alerts to fans of that team worldwide. They've got over 45,000 uh, amateur sporting teams using Game Changer today. And he reports that they generate as much data in one afternoon as Major League Baseball generates an entire season. Let's hear it for Kirill and Game Changer Media. So these are our doers. Like Software Yoda would say, do or do not, there is no try. Let's hear it for the doers in our community. Let's hear it for all the software people of the world who are making the world a better place every day. Let's hear it, come on. All right, we are continually amazed with what people are building. Let's check in on some of, uh, uh, some of what you're building and how this is going. So first of all, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about TwilioCon itself. So um, uh, we, we started TwilioCon to gather our community under one roof so we could all uh, build and learn from each other. And uh, in 2010, we had uh, zero. We actually didn't have TwilioCon that year. Um, it was very lonely uh, in October of 2010. But last year, we had our first TwilioCon, and we had a little over 350 attendees to TwilioCon one year ago. And today, we're excited to announce that we've got over 1,000 people registered for TwilioCon 2012. We are really excited to have you here. <laughs> and our community itself, you know, in 2010, we had 15,000 developers using Twilio at this time two years ago. And last year at TwilioCon, we were excited to announce that we had 50,000 developers in our community. And today, we're excited to announce that we've got nearly 150,000 developers using Twilio to build things every single day. <laughs> and notably, it took us three years to find our first 50,000 developers, and just seven months to, next, to find the next 50, and just four months to find the next 50. So we love that you guys are building things on Twilio and joining our community. And here's what you did with Twilio in the last year. So in America, there's about 220 million adults. And your applications interacted with over 150 million phone numbers. That represents 70% of American adults that your applications touched. One of the things your applications do is you record voicemails and call centers, you record uh, call center conversations. And you guys now store on Twilio over 100 million minutes of call recordings. And last year, we talked about the volume of what you guys were doing on top of Twilio, and we showed how your use of Twilio had grown over the last year. And that's where we were last year. And we're really excited to show that what you have building has been taking the world by storm, and your usage of Twilio has been growing significantly over the past year. Your apps are being used. You are building winners. That is so exciting. And to break that down on a daily basis, uh, we grew a lot. And last year, we had, uh, on a daily basis, an average of about 300,000 calls per day. 
but in 2012, your applications are doing nearly 1.5 million calls per day. Your applications are doing amazing, amazing things. And lastly, we just reached a milestone. We've got half a billion phone calls that have been done on the Twilio platform, 80% of those in the last year. So your applications are going nuts. You are building things that customers want. Last year, uh, we also launched a short code product to let people use short codes to message with customers here in North America. We made it easy, we made it transparent. We took the shenanigans out of short codes. And then in August, we improved that process from all of our learning in the last year, and we made it even easier. And since we made the short code product easy and removed the shenanigans, in recent months, your traffic accounts for 50% of market share of new short codes registered in the United States. That is simply amazing. So that's why we feel good, because we know that you guys are building great things for your users, and these metrics make us feel good, because we know we're solving a problem for you. And every time we grow, we can help you even more. Let's take a look at, one, uh, at what one customer of ours is doing. They've got a great story. Uber is everyone's private driver. You get out your iPhone, you push a button, and in five minutes, a town car arrives. It's a pretty seamless experience. It kind of feels like you're living in the future. The information about the driver, about his star rating, about his phone number, about how far away he is, we're sending those updates via text. You can't have your own private driver without having a great customer experience. If the car's waiting for 10 minutes and you haven't been told, there's a problem. And it's crucial for the rider to have that information so that he can connect with the driver. We built the Uber experience without Twilio initially. And the problem was people were not getting the high quality experience that we were promising. And the kinds of problems that we were seeing with the other providers, we just have not seen with Twilio. Straight up, I sleep easier, my engineers sleep easier because we're not dealing with situations where it's taking 10, 15, 20 minutes for a text to be delivered. It's been invaluable to have a reliable service to tell folks what's going on with their ride. Twilio works fast like we do. Uber is now launching in a lot of international markets and Twilio is helping us with that because they operate in a lot of different international markets. The messages are delivered very quickly. We can rely on it. And it's helped us scale internationally as we grow as a company. Our global vision is really one of cities, not really about countries. If there's a major city somewhere out there, you can be pretty certain that Uber's gonna be there. Having one telecommunications provider that ultimately will cover all the countries and cities that we go to, that's critical for us. As a customer, we've just had a really great experience. I like to work with companies that have the same kind of vision and foresight. Twilio looks at a customer experience and really designs the product around it. And that's how I feel about what Uber does as well. Uh, I love what Uber is doing, right? Because they have taken transportation, physical transportation, and turned it into a software problem and are creating a great experience. So awesome company, Uber. Now I want to introduce you to another customer of ours who knows a thing or two about customer experience, Zendesk. Uh, so please welcome up on stage Sam Boonin, who's the VP of Customer Engagement at Zendesk, and he's going to talk a bit about what they've learned uh, with Zendesk Voice in the last year. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for inviting us. We're really super happy to be here. Um, uh, Zendesk, I'm sure many in the audience know who Zendesk is. We provide customer support software in the cloud. 20,000 companies use us. Uh, over 100 million end users uh, interact with uh, companies that use Zendesk. And similar to what Jeff said, uh, we do believe that customer and user experience is really what matters today. So <clears throat> we built our software, and we strive to improve our software for support agents who are spending all day or maybe some of their day interacting with their customers. We also try to make our software for the end users who are asking questions of companies. So that's always been a focus of the company from day one. We, um, we launched uh, Zendesk Voice at TwilioCon last year, about 13 months ago. And um, 
Our goal, similar to everything you're hearing today, was to make it a really beautifully simple, really integrated experience. So what that meant was not just attaching a phone number to a Zendesk, but making it deeply integrated into the product. What that means here, as you see here, is you know, what may look relatively simple is a screen pop uh, when a call comes in, but that includes um, you know, the, who the caller is and, and, and tie that to the caller's information so that the agent who answers the phone know who he or she is talking to. It also means um, all of the, the power that Twilio gives us, making sure that we can um, capture phone calls, transcriptions, voicemails, et cetera, and probably most importantly, make it really super simple and easy to sign up. So you can come to Zendesk, you can sign up for a Zendesk account, and you can provision a, a Zendesk voice phone number in three clicks. So um, this is what we launched about 13 months ago, and a lot of you know, what our expectation was is probably similar to a lot of you in the audience. We had no idea. We didn't know what to expect. Um, uh, we didn't know whether people had been asking for voice. We didn't know whether people would use it or not. And, and what we found was, was somewhat surprising, and, uh, and this. And this is sort of the, uh, the world map of Zendesk Voice, if you will. So we launched it initially uh, in North America only. Uh, and, and what happened almost from the get-go is that we were getting sign-ups for Zendesk Voice around the world. Uh, obviously, if you've played Risk, you know that the bigger the, bigger the bubble, the more likely you are to take over the world. But what you see here is, um, you know, huge adoption of our customers for Zendesk Voice. They very much want to interact with their customers over the phone. We, um, like a lot of us, you know, sort of companies born on the web, we sort of thought that all the new sexy channels were the important ones, but people really like talking to other people, and this is what we see. So where we've been in the last 13 months is um, uh, Zendesk voice accounts in over 65 countries, um, uh, over 1,700 accounts, those are unique, um, you know, different companies, uh, more phone numbers than that because people provision multiple Zendesk voice numbers. Uh, per account, and somewhere around the line of 20,000 hours of live calls, um, uh, which, which we really like. Um, if you look a little bit about, as I mentioned, we started with, um, with North America only. Uh, when Twilio rolled out um, European numbers, uh, we supported uh, 13 countries. So uh, not all the countries that Twilio supports, but 13 of them, there are the flags and the names of the countries, and, and, and look what happened. We got adoption in countries that, don't even, that we don't even provide voice support for. So people in, in Latvia and, and, um, and Slovakia and Slovenia, which few people know are different countries, um, and Greece and Turkey and some of these countries, uh, they're adopting Zendesk Voice because they want to talk to their customers. And this is what we've seen um, as we roll this out is that People, if you put it out there, if you make it simple, people will adopt it and people will use it. So we're super excited about that. Um, and the last thing is, uh, one of the benefits of, of Zendesk is we help customers track customer satisfaction of their customers. And when you look at that data across channels, so you know, how are you providing good support? How are you making your customers happy? Um, this is really interesting. And again, nothing against um, our friends at Facebook, but what we found was that voice was the happiest channel for customers. So when our customers interacted with their customers via voice, they were able to give the best customer experience. Uh, you see here that this is just an example of uh, voice versus, um, versus Facebook. So not only is it easy to build, not only is it easy to get adopted, but it does what we ultimately want to do, which is help our customers delight their customers. So. Um, Again, happy to be here and uh, really happy to see the triple the audience from last year. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Um, very cool. So that is uh, uh, that, Sam, an amazing story about what they've been building with Zendesk Voice. And I love the experience that they've created, an amazing, uh, amazing experience of signing up for Zendesk. So, uh, next, I wanted to introduce uh, a partner. We started working with the people from uh, Windows Azure earlier this year because they are building a great platform in the cloud for developers. 
and enabling software people to build amazing things. And yesterday, they launched Azure Mobile Services, a backend for mobile applications that's really easy to use and very powerful. And uh, we were partnered on that launch because they incorporated Twilio so that uh, developers using Windows Azure could send and receive text messages and make and receive phone calls with Twilio. So please welcome up a uh, special guest today, Scott Guthrie, who is the VP, the Corporate Vice President of Windows Azure at Microsoft. Scott, there hey, you are. Hey, How's it you. going? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's great to be here at uh, TwilioCon. So as Jeff mentioned, Microsoft, uh, Windows Azure is uh, Microsoft's cloud computing platform, and we've been partnering with Twilio the last several months. Uh, and just yesterday, we shipped a significant update that makes it really easy to build cloud backends for mobile apps and devices and integrate them with Twilio-based services. And what I thought I'd do is just spend a little bit of time today uh, walking through a simple solution um, showing it off in action. So, once I log back into my laptop, uh, what I'm going to walk through is a simple um, uh, application that's cloud enabled that allows me to manage to do lists across all my devices. Uh, and I want to be able to uh, easily manage them, uh, again, across any device, and optionally share them with friends and let them participate in those lists as well. Uh, and you can see right here, to start off with, uh, I have a simple Windows 8 application um, that I'm going to be running. I see a couple different items on my list, and I can add a new item to demo. And this is going to save that list in the cloud. And what I want to be able to do in this demo is uh, now take this list and share it with Jeff on his iPhone so he can see the list as well, edit the items, uh, and participate um, as well. And we're going to use Windows Azure Mobile Services and Twilio in order to enable this experience. So to get started, I can go to the windowsazure.com website. It provides a lot of information about Azure, enables you to easily sign up and, and see developer guides on how to do it. Once you're signed in, you can just go ahead and click our portal link, which will take you to our web-based admin portal that provides a unified view for all the services we provide and allows you to manage your applications uh, through a web-based interface. And you can create lots of different types of services with Azure. And one of the new ones that we just shipped uh, is support for building what we call a mobile service. Uh, and again, this is a back end that you can use uh, to target uh, mobile apps against. And it provides storage, identity, push, and a, and a host of other integration services that you can take advantage of. And all I need to do is just give it a name, pick where in the world I want to run it. Uh, and then with literally within about a minute, I'll have a complete mobile back end up and running that I can start using. Now, what I have here is an application uh, that I started working on a little bit earlier uh, called uh, Twilio Doodoo. Um, and uh, this is going to be the back end that I'm going to use for all my uh, mobile apps here today. And one of the things you'll notice is when you first go into a mobile service, uh, we have kind of a nice getting started guide, or what we call a quick start, uh, with instructions on how to build, say, a, a Windows-based app, or uh, if you want, how to build an iOS-based application. Um, using our SDK, uh, and it's pretty easy. You just download the SDK, add it into Xcode in this case, and uh, reference the appropriate key, and then you can start connecting and programming against this backend. And you can do a bunch of different things with it. So for example, if I click on the Identity tab, I can enter in uh, my secret, or in this case, not-so-secret keys, um, or not any more secret keys, for a variety of different social uh, providers, so I can use authentication on the system. Uh, I can go ahead and enter, uh, create tables on the back end that I can use in order to save data and persist it. Uh, so for example, if I click into my items table here, uh, you can see that do demo uh, item that I just added earlier. And the cool thing is connecting any mobile app to this back end is really easy. Uh, and so this is actually all the code that's necessary in that Windows 8 app in order to connect to that back end, log in with using whatever authentication provider I selected, uh, and then query. Uh, the data from that service and insert new items into it. And uh, the great thing is I don't have to write any server-side code in order to get that basic CRUD functionality working. Uh, so it enables me as a client developer to really make a lot of progress quickly um, and uh, get a whole backend stood up that's scalable and can run anywhere in the world. So this is a simple way to just sort of save data. What I want to do now is enable uh, Jeff to edit it on his iPhone as well. And that's where we're going to start bringing in Twilio and take advantage of that. And so to share my list here, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, invite a user. Uh, this is using the new Windows 8 uh, People Picker. And so I can select uh, Jeff here, hit OK. Uh, and then if we can show the iPhone at the same time, we'll start to bring up this iPhone view here. 
I'm invited now. Yeah, almost. We're going to hit yes. And this is going to go ahead now and uh, send a uh, SMS message you can see right here uh, within that list. Now, how did this happen? Even before you hit accept on that, let's go back uh, and look at what the code was happening on the back end here within Windows Azure. So I showed an items list a little earlier where I was showing all the items in my to-do list. You'll notice I also have a, an invites table um, that we've created on the server as well. And uh, what I did when I hit that add friend within my Windows app was I basically wrote to this invites table. Now, one of the cool things about Azure Mobile Services is not only can you save data, but we also have a nice server-side scripting model built in Node.js. Uh, where you can go ahead and write custom scripts that execute as well when certain operations happen in the system. And so all I had to do here was just go to the scripts tab and paste in this little server-side JavaScript, which is calling out to Twilio and sending that SMS message. And so really only in about 15 lines of code, um, I was able to go ahead now and every time someone adds an invite, send it off to uh, 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 Twilio and have it show up on his iPhone. And so now if you just click that I invite. So now I'm, in, I'm invited. And so I go to the to-do list. Oh, and it, and it pulls up the mobile app automatically. Yep. And there's items. Just click that item and accept. Accept it. There, there we go. There we go. All right, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> then we got, so we got our list of items. Oh, I can create a new item right in you here. You can create a new item. All right, let's do that. How about, uh, so wake up, go to ToledoCon, do demo um, party. <laughs> you know, party hard. <laughs> All right. And that's sending it now uh, back. And notice on the right, left-hand side here, we got a notification. And it's popped up and integrated on the Windows 8 side as well. Uh, awesome. So really easy to start uh, enable and sharing, uh, integrate across the two systems. Now, one of the cool things about Twilio, of course, is not only can you send them SMS messages uh, and calls, but you can also interact in a bi-directional way. Uh, and so for example, in this app, we added a feature where instead of having to use an app, uh, you can go ahead to the settings. We can enable SMS notifications uh, within this and just hit save. Uh, and what this is going to do now is it's going to allow me to not only uh, use the app to manage the list, but I can also just use vanilla SMS. And so I go back now to this Windows 8 app, add another item, sleep. Um, <laughs> I can go ahead now and basically uh, saved it here. Uh, this, you'll notice, just sent me an SMS message uh, with a sleep item there, and now well, you can, we can actually... We, we can pretend. That, we can pretend, that we, yeah. We've had almost a there. To sleep, yeah, exactly, almost. And you can just type so in done, done 72 on that so item. I inverted 27, 72, there we go, done 72. 72, and now if we go back on this side, Boom. notice the item's gone, uh, and uh, we just basically sent an SMS message back through Windows Azure Mobile Services. It was able to update the data, notify all the clients. And we got a simple bi-directional app going, literally with only about 15 or 20 lines of total code. Wow. So the simple example of what you can do, uh, you can do everything we've just done here uh, by uh, going to windowsazure.com, signing up, and using it. Uh, we've got a hackathon later tonight. We've got people from the team here on the Windows Azure side to help if you're interested in trying it out. And we also got a session here tomorrow. And we're really looking forward to seeing what type of apps you build with it. So thanks a bunch. Awesome. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks. Fabulous. Isn't that cool? Uh, great, great stuff uh, that, that the Azure team is doing. I really love it. So uh, let's talk about a few new things here. Uh, first of all, um, you know, one of the things we've always known since we started Twilio, right? Twilio is not a product. Like, we're not a solution. We don't solve everyone's, uh, anyone's problem, but we actually give you the ability to solve people's problems. And so working with you is incredibly important. And so we're announcing two programs today. Uh, first is a partner program. And so this is an official way for us to work with you. The reason is we get customers calling us every day saying, you know, I want to use Twilio to do this, or I want to use Twilio to do that. Wait a minute, what's PHP? I don't know what that is, right? And so what we want to be able to do is hook people up who need solutions with developers in our community who have built those solutions or who can build it for them. And so our goal with the partner program is to help you grow your business in a number of ways. So first of all, we're targeting ISVs and system integrators. You know, ISVs are people who've built a solution that we can send customers to that they can sign up for and start using. And integrators are people who build custom solutions for uh, clients that maybe integrate custom things or write code for clients. But either way, you people, ISVs and integrators, are building those solutions that the rest of the world is going to consume. 
So our goal, we're gonna help you in the partner program with marketing support, with sales support, and with technical support. Because our goal is to help you build your business, get your message out, close customers, and provide great technical products to those people. Because that's how we're gonna let the cloud take over, uh, is by getting that in the hands of customers out there. So if you fit this bill, if you're an ISV or you're a system integrator, we wanna hear from you. Please go today to tulio.com slash partners to contact us to get, a part, to get to be a part of the partner program. Really excited about that. So please do that. The next thing we're announcing is that uh, you know, we've had a developer gallery for the past couple of years, but uh, honestly, it, it's, it's not been looking great lately. It got a little shabby over the years. So today, we're giving it a huge facelift. Uh, and we're making the developer gallery uh, beautiful, and we're making it really into a platform that you as independent developers can use to showcase what it is uh, you can build, showcase your skills, showcase your projects, and ultimately to get work. So we wanted to make it beautiful, and we wanted to make it so that you could really uh, give a profile that would help you win business from potential Twilio customers. So you can show off your skills, you can show off things that you've built, and you can show off uh, uh, where you are so that people come in and say, I want to find a PHP developer in my area, they'll find you. And they'll see your profile, and then they'll be able to contact you uh, via social media or any contact information you put up there. So we're really excited to get this out here because we want to connect our customers with doers who can build things for, uh, for customers every day. So that's going to be live, or that is live, twilio.com slash doers. And you can update your profile in your Twilio account portal. And in fact, today, we've got a gallery studio set up in our doer bar outside. So at any point, today or tomorrow, you can go over there, you can get a professional looking photo taken, uh, and you can update your profile, and we've got Tulians there who can help you do it. So please take advantage of that. Go, uh, update your profile, get it spiffed up, because we want to send customers your way. That's the developer gallery. Um, and then lastly, in the, uh, in the uh, topic of partners, I uh, wanted to notice, as, as you guys may have heard, uh, we've started partnering with tier one carriers around the world. Uh, to help get Twilio in the hands of more and more people. Uh, and uh, so we don't have announcements today about that, but you will be hearing more about this in the coming weeks and months. We're really excited uh, to bring Twilio more, to more partners worldwide. All right. So we are building a better Twilio every day. And it's because we're listening to you and we're finding out what you need to go serve your customers, and we improve Twilio uh, every day. And today, we've got a few new things that we wanted to share with you. So first of all, you know, we're software people, right? And what's the bane of our existence? Bugs, right? Uh, building great software is about battling bugs and making things great. And for you, uh, as software developers, you know, there's a lot of tools that you use, right? You write unit tests, you write functional tests, you write integration tests, you've got test-driven development, right? We've developed all these ways to write great high-quality software and get rid of bugs. But there's a problem, which is Twilio uh, has this uh, nasty habit of making phone calls and buying numbers and sending text messages to people because that's what Twilio does. So today, we're announcing what we call Twilio test credentials. Twilio test credentials uh, are a special account SID and auth token that you can put into your tests when you talk to Twilio's live API so that the API that makes calls and sends text messages and provisions phone numbers and costs you money, when you run your unit tests, will no longer make calls or send text messages or provision phone numbers or cost you money. And this is really important because in order to uh, transition to the cloud and in order to build great applications, you guys have to be able to test your apps. And so you should build unit tests, functional tests. You should do automated testing suites. You should be able to deploy with confidence every single time. And Twilio wants to help you do that. That's what test credentials are about. They're live in your account portal today. So when you write your unit tests and your functional tests, use these credentials instead. And now uh, you can write fully functional unit tests that exercise the full Twilio API. So we're really excited. Use those. Write great tests. Write great software. All right, next. A lot of people out there, you are building great applications. You're building for the cloud. And a lot of these applications you're building are subscription billing applications, right? This is the natural business model of the cloud, is to write monthly recurring subscription software. And so a lot of people are writing these kinds of applications. It makes total sense. And some of the common features of many SaaS applications are things like you know, reports, showing your users what they've done and what their usage has been, uh, you know, or analytics and charts and graphs and dashboards. 
showing people uh, their usage uh, of your product. Or at the end of the month, when it's time to send them a uh, bill, uh, and you've got to invoice them. And these are common things that a lot of SaaS people have to build uh, when you're building an application on top of Twilio. The thing is, building these things is very hard today. You either need to keep your own database of every call or every text message and keep track of the costs and all this kind of stuff, uh, and it's very hard to do, and you've got to scale that uh, and make it accurate and then run nasty queries at the end of the month. Uh, or you can talk to Twilio's API, because we have all this information in our REST API, call logs, SMS logs, all this stuff. So you can pull us, but you know what? To draw the information that I have on the screen right now, pulling that data from our REST API, it would require uh, over 500 API requests to draw this information uh, that you have, right? So this is really hard, and it's way too hard, and the thing that sucks about it is that this is not what your customers are buying. You need this, it's infrastructure, but ultimately, this isn't what the customer needs. This isn't focusing on the user. This is sort of that uh, nuts and bolts layer. So today, we're excited to announce the Twilio Usage API. The Twilio Usage API are real-time counters of usage of your Twilio account in one simple API. So what that means is that you can uh, pull down for either your main uh, Twilio accounts or if you guys have multi-tenant applications built on Twilio, uh, your sub-accounts, you can pull down information like how many calls did my app do? How many minutes did my app do? How many messages did my app send? Or how many phone numbers is my app using? Right? These are just examples. Uh, recordings, how many recordings did my app do? Basically, anything that you do in Twilio there are counters for, and you can pull down real-time data about what that stuff is. And what's really neat in particular is it's aggregated by usage. Uh, so you can say, how many, you know, how many minutes did my thing do? But it's also aggregated by spending, how much money was spent. Um, and so you can pull down this information in real time. We also have it historical, you know, by day, by month, by year, or forever. So it's a really flexible way for you to figure out what your users are doing uh, and be able to pull that data down and then be able to build uh, all that functionality, uh, reports, analytics, and billing, all very simple with one API request. Each one of these use cases you could build with one API request to the usage API and then take that data and format it on the screen for what you're trying to do. So we wanted to make that really easy. So again, you guys can focus on delighting your users, uh, not on the infrastructure. So this is a big part. We're really excited about this. It's in the uh, docs today. There we go. Uh, Twilio.com slash docs slash API slash rest slash usage records. But you know what? You can just go in the docs in the right nav, and you'll see the documentation. You'll get started using it. And uh, you'll be up and running building really advanced reporting uh, in, I'm going to guess, under an hour. It's really easy. There we go. All right. So again, so you guys are building these SaaS applications. They're uh, really uh, amazing. And you are taking over uh, these big legacy markets with easy to use subscription SaaS, right? It's great. But telecom is special, right? It's not like a lot of SaaS applications because communications has some hard costs, right? So a lot of times you build into your pricing model some limits, right? You might say, you know, these are the packages, the 5,000 minute, the 10,000 minute, the 2,000 minute package, right? Or, you know, maybe you do that on messages, or maybe you've got even a really complex model and you actually do it on uh, both. Uh, and so there's all sorts of different ways in which you are building applications and you're pricing them. But again, in order to build this, you have to keep track of a whole lot of data. You have to keep your database up to date of how many calls or messages that they do uh, and make sure that people aren't going over uh, their plans or make sure you build them properly. Uh, and this is really hard, right? You've, and we've heard from customers that building your own billing system to be able to keep track of all this stuff is uh, a big pain, and we totally understand it. And so we added another thing to that usage API I just showed you, and we call it the usage triggers API. These are webhooks that notify your app when usage thresholds are met. So you can take any metric at all that's available in that usage API. Minutes, messages, dollars spent, any of that stuff, and based on usage, based on price, any of those metrics. And you can take it on any time scale that you want, daily, monthly, yearly, forever. And you can ask Twilio to call back to your app when that threshold is hit, is, is hit for that account. And this is really powerful. Because for you, it means that you can create your billing models and set and forget, and Twilio will tell your app when any of these usage thresholds are hit. So for example, you could say things like, um, when you know, minutes on this account hits 5,000 per day, give me a webhook. You can say things like, uh, when messages hit 100,000 per day, give me a webhook. My app wants to know. 
Or when a customer's uh, lifetime spend hits $500, give me a webhook, let me know. There's a ton of use cases for this, right? We built it because you, know, you can use, use things like I told you, the billing uh, tiers have been hit, and you can notify customers that they've uh, used up their allocation. Uh, then you can go into overage billing and let them know, hey, I'm going to bill you uh, over here going forward. Uh, you can also use it for sales engagement. Right? A customer just spent $500 a month. Maybe my uh, sales team is going to reach out to them um, and uh, say, hey, how can we help you further? Uh, and you can also use it for things like fraud uh, detection. So there's all sorts of use cases for it. And we're really excited. This is live today. It is in the docs, uh, right next to the usage API of the usage triggers. And again, just go in the uh, API docs. You'll see it there. Start building uh, apps that take advantage of these usage triggers. They're really powerful. It's one of the most flexible, powerful APIs we've ever built. All right, so I want to talk about another thing that's really important to us, and that is supporting you. So Twilio support, we view support as a product. And in fact, since Twilio come last year, we have more than tripled the size of our support team. And we've done a lot of other interesting things, too, to make support better. First of all, we launched a really cool new help section of the site. Uh, I don't know if you remember it last year. Uh, it wasn't uh, up to what we wanted, and this is a great new help center. It's got a lot of great content, got a great search, very discoverable stuff. Uh, and just last week, we incorporated help tickets into the account portal. So now you can browse uh, support tickets in the account portal, and you can submit a ticket uh, online in the account portal. Uh, because a lot of people prefer uh, the web uh, portal, the web view of it, where all that information is together in one spot. But you know what? If you like email, you can keep using email, too. Uh, we tried to make it easy for everybody, uh, regardless of the interface that they want. And so over the last year, we've done over 50,000 support emails with our customers because we have a technical product and we have a technical audience. And so there's a lot of questions people have about how to build apps or how to scale apps or all these kinds of things. And so we take uh, pride in the quality of what we do in support, and we keep a lot of metrics and we uh, uh, benchmark ourselves against the industry to make sure we're doing a good job. And I just want to share a few things that we're proud of. So first of all, the industry average in B2B SaaS is 7.8 tickets per day. Twilio does close to 60 tickets a day. Our average response time, the industry average is 21.1 hours on a 24 by 7 basis. And at Twilio, our average response time is 8.9 hours. And during the business day, it's a little over three hours. And lastly, customer satisfaction, industry average is 91% customer satisfaction for B2B software, and Twilio, we're at 96. So we pride ourselves in doing a really good job, and we really hope that uh, you are getting the support that you need, because we take a lot of pride in this. But you know what we heard from a lot of customers is, you're building mission-critical applications, you're supporting your customers, and you wanted more. You wanted things like phone support, you wanted 24 by 7 uh, technical support, uh, you wanted email and phone response SLAs, um, and you wanted uh, all of this stuff because you are supporting your customers, and you need to know uh, that when there's issues or when you have, uh, when you have questions, that you're going to get them answered very, uh, very easily. So uh, what we've got today is we're launching premium support for Twilio. What premium support is, we've got four support plans. Uh, for uh, all kinds of different users, right? So we've got free, the bootstrap plan, the phone plan, and the 24 by 7 plan. Uh, everybody gets email. No change there. Everybody gets great email support. But now we're adding response SLAs. And for your most critical issues, we get up to a one-hour uh, SLA that we will get back to you on that issue. Uh, we get phone support. You can pick up the phone, and you can call Twilio, and you can help work through an issue on the phone. And uh, you can get emergency priority, one hour response and real time phone support for your most critical use cases. Uh, now, staffing support uh, is uh, time consuming and it costs money for us to uh, hire people around the world and have the infrastructure to do this. Um, but what we've done is we've made it uh, easy to get into and we've made the whole plan elastic so that you can sign up for support one month and cancel it the next month. You can upgrade when you need uh, during a critical development time and then downgrade the next month. So there's no contracts, there's no commitments. It's just month to month, and you can do uh, whatever you want for your need at that point in time of your company. Uh, and we've made it really easy for you to upgrade and downgrade because it's all right on the portal. And with a credit card, you can buy support, and you can change it any time to fit your support needs in real time. So all of these things, Twilio support, the usage API, test credentials, these are all designed to help you build and scale great applications. Um, next, a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, we launched Twilio Client. And we made it so that it was easy for you to build applications that crossed every platform where you're building. 
right? So you could build applications uh, that span the browser, mobile devices, and traditional phones. In fact, your browser or your mobile app could now call real phones with Twilio Client. And real phones can call your mobile apps or your browser-based apps. And we released Twilio Client for the web, for iOS, and for Android. And what Twilio Client consists of are a set of audio pipes that let you open that audio channel from your app into Twilio, and then use Twimble to do whatever you want. We have named endpoints so that you can uh, take each of your uh, client installations, you can give a name to that user, and then you can dial them from the cloud and make your uh, app essentially ring. Uh, and then we added user presence last year at TwilioCon uh, so that your app knew who was online so you could do things like smart call routing or you could show a buddy list to your users of who is available to chat. We did uh, all of these things um, with Twilio Client. And you guys are building some amazing things. Uh, a few neat ones, Bumble Phone, it's a web-based phone for kids. Uh, that is safe, so a parent configures who you're allowed to call, and then you give uh, the child uh, this website, and they can click the button, and then the browser rings, and suddenly you're talking to grandpa or grandma or aunt or uncle. Uh, it's really neat. Ring DNA is an amazing app, right? This is on the iPad, and it supports marketing, uh, sales, and support people with a call center running entirely on the iPad. And you plug in a headset or use Bluetooth, and you can now talk to people and receive calls on an iPad wherever you are, and it's fully integrated into Salesforce. Um, and another neat one is Fruition Partners uh, built uh, what they call FruPhone. And this brings a web-based phone into uh, the help desk of ServiceNow and lets, uh, lets uh, help desk uh, uh, people get web-based telephony in their ServiceNow installations, right? So you guys are building some really uh, amazing, amazing things. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this product is only a year old, and you guys are figuring out how to use it. Let's take a look at what another one of our customers has been doing in the last year with Twilio Client. What we do at Red Beacon is we help homeowners or consumers find pros to do work on their home. Things like plumbers, electrician, house cleaners, and this year we started talks with Home Depot about doing a partnership with them and they acquired us in January. So since January, Red Beacon has been part of the Home Depot. When a customer comes to our website or uses our app and puts in a job request, we notify the pro when we match that pro to the job via an SMS using Twilio that they have a new job to quote on. Whenever the pro's quotes come in or if the consumer has questions, they then either inbound call us or we sometimes call back out to the customer using the Twilio client. In the Home Depot stores, a consumer might say, I need help with a plumbing project. Associates in their aprons collect their phone number, and then we outbound call back to that customer to find out what their need is using a Twilio client. So we use Twilio across everything we do every day. So when we decided that we wanted to upgrade our call center capability here at Red Beacon, we looked around at the market and we had a very short timeline because we had been acquired by Home Depot and we wanted to launch in some of the stores. And we had about eight weeks what we currently had capability-wise was not gonna do it, and integrating any of the existing sort of big solutions would have taken much more work. We believe the best thing about working with Twilio or building our call center on top of it is that really it's up to our imagination what the experience is gonna be like. Virtually anything is possible. It's up to you how much you build on top of the Twilio system, but it enables anything to be built. Most people think of their call center as something off in the basement. They don't really want to deal with it, but increasingly people understand that the customer interaction is the most valuable thing. You should spend as much time, if not more, that you spend on your website or your app or however you get your business from your customer with any customer interaction that you have. And Twilio is the beginning of that revolution when all companies can build their own communications app or their own communications product. That will be a differentiator in the marketplace. Very cool. Red Beacon and Home Depot have been building some really amazing stuff uh, to connect contractors up with shoppers in Home Depot stores um, and using Toyo Client to do it. And so, you know, one of the things that's neat is we introduced this, this, this product, Toyo Client, and you can put voice into a browser, into an iOS and Android app, and people have been figuring out how to use it. And um, since we launched it, you know, it's often the case with new technology, people start playing around, figuring out, well, how can I use this? How can I create a great customer experience, uh, experience with it? And what's amazing to show is that since the beginning of the year, you guys have figured it out 
you guys are building some amazing things on top of Twilio Client. In fact, last year at TwilioCon, we announced presence to let your, uh, we announced, uh, you know, user presence to know who's online. And since then, your applications have spent over 100 million hours connected to Twilio's cloud. So really cool applications that you guys are building. But there's another thing that's been going on in the web ecosystem. And you guys may have heard of it. It's an amazing uh, project uh, called WebRTC. And WebRTC brings advanced communications capabilities into the browser without plugins. It's native code. And it gives access to the microphone, to the camera, to the network, all in a very, uh, a very high quality experience. You know, Google Chrome is committed. Uh, they're going to launch it in Chrome 23, which is expected to drop next month. Uh, and it's now in Firefox Nightlies as well. It's the quality of desktop software built into the browser for networking and multimedia capabilities. So we're really excited to announce that we've built WebRTC into Twilio Client. And we now support WebRTC in beta as part of Twilio Client. It's got an improved user experience. We love the native permissions dialog. It's got great codecs built in for audio that uh, were designed from the ground up for real-time communications. And it's got a great networking stack. Again, native quality code in the browser for multimedia experience. This is a huge move forward. The web and the internet is taking a huge step forward with WebRTC. And we're really excited to be right there with it. So, uh, this is uh, an amazing uh, include. You just include the new beta file in your app, and we will auto-detect the environment of the browser, and we'll do the right thing. We'll basically use the best stack available in that browser. So we'll use WebRTC if it's available, and we'll make it all seamless and easy for you. And this is in beta today. So just go to twilio.com slash beta slash WebRTC to get the URL for your JavaScript that you embed in, uh, and you can start testing with WebRTC today in Twilio Client. And one of the uh, neat things is it, it, uh, Google Chrome is going to GA uh, 23, we believe, next month. That's what it looks like from our friends down in Mountain View. And as soon as they do, the minute Google Chrome drops, we're going to have it in GA uh, ready to be live for your applications. So WebRTC, amazing new technology for the internet. Really excited to make it a part of the Twilio Client experience. So one of the other things that we've been hearing from, from customers, uh, especially some uh, bigger customers, have big investments in legacy equipment. Legacy equipment that is sitting in uh, closets. The investment has already been made. And you know, maybe it's call centers, or maybe it's uh, you know, PBX around the office. Uh, but you've got an existing investment. But what people want to do when they come to Twilio, they say, hey, you know, we've got all this gear. What we want to do is do some new things. We want to make it, uh, teach it some new tricks, and we want to build some really cool stuff. But you know, it's really hard with our legacy without continuing to invest more and more and more in this legacy infrastructure uh, to get it to do new things. What we really want to do is to take all of the intelligence of our application, and we want to move it to the cloud. And we've got the legacy investment, but we're going to use that to get you know, the call into the ear of, of our agent or the ear of one of my employees. But all the intelligence, all the smarts of that application are going to live in the cloud, right? because that's where we have the APIs to connect to our databases, to our business logic, to things like Salesforce or using Twilio's new queuing functionality. Because we want to do things like you know, website callbacks or you know, Salesforce triggered callbacks or you know, call centers that integrate with, with Salesforce, all this kind of stuff. And so you're building all this application logic now in the cloud. You're making your smarts move to the cloud. And you've got all this code, and you've got all this data now in your Twimmel app, in your cloud-based application. But then the time comes to bridge that call to the user who's sitting at a desk. And you use the phone network. You dial a 10-digit number, and all the context of that application is lost. Because you drop down to the lowest common denominator, the PSTN. So today, we're announcing the beta of SIP connectivity for Twilio. This means that you can connect your Twilio applications to your on-prem SIP infrastructure. You can integrate these two. And it's dead simple to integrate it, and it's extremely robust. Let me walk you through uh, quickly how it works here. So you guys are accustomed to Twimmel. You know how this works. Uh, you can dial any phone number. Uh, you can just say dial number. Uh, 8675309, and you can call Jenny. But now with SIP, it's just as easy as saying dial SIP. And now, Jenny, I've got your SIP address. 
So, it is very simple. Thank you. So we made it dead simple for you to incorporate SIP into your applications. But it doesn't end there, right? Just dialing uh, the call is the beginning. But you know what? We wanted to provide a really deep integration because that's where the value really comes in. So we made it so you can pass headers, you can pass arbitrary data from your Twilio application into your SIP infrastructure. So you can pass all that data and do things like screen pops for agents uh, or any uh, application logic that you may already have running on that legacy equipment. You can pass data that's coming out of your databases or out of Salesforce or anything else and pass it to that uh, existing applications. You can also receive information back from the on-prem equipment via SIP, and that gets passed to your Twimmel applications. So we really bridge the metadata world of SIP and be able to pass information fluidly back and forth to your Twimmel-based applications. So it's designed from the ground up for this deep integration between your cloud-based infrastructure and your legacy on-prem stuff. Um, the other thing we did is we made it robust because you need it to just work, right? You want to focus on the application layer. Uh, and so we built in these features like automatic network failover so you can give us multiple endpoints and we will automatically fail over uh, if, if you're having any network issues at one of your sites. Uh, we will also do things like dynamic round robin routing uh, if you want us to load balance traffic over multiple sites and things like that. So basically, your Twilio SIP integration can be advanced as the SIP network that you have built out. Uh, and we've also thought a lot about uh, security and how to make this secure. Uh, so we use standard SIP authentication, and we've got TLS, transport layer security, uh, built in out of the gate. So it's really the best enterprise security practices around voice over IP are built in to Twilio SIP. Thank you. <laughs> So we've given a lot of thought to this. And uh, it's is in beta today. Um, and if you want to be in the beta, you can go to the doer bar back there and request access to the beta. But just because it's beta doesn't mean it's new. In fact, this is the exact same SIP infrastructure that Twilio has already done half a billion phone calls on. It's just today we're exposing it directly to you. So we're really excited. Uh, Twilio.com slash beta slash SIP. If you want to learn more about the beta, uh, for people who are here at TwilioCon, you can go to the doer bar and request access. So that's Twilio SIP. And wow, we've been busy. I'm getting tired. So one of the other biggest things that we've heard all along since we launched Twilio is we want Twilio to be global. We want Twilio to have one API with global reach. Because it makes sense. As software people, we don't really understand geopolitical boundaries. You know, if you're building an app, if you're building a website, people from all over the world come to your website, and it just works. Or you want to send an email, you just send it to an email address. You don't care what country it's in. Um, or you build a mobile app, right? And you submit it to the App Store, and it's live in 50 countries overnight, right? We generally don't think about geopolitical boundaries of things. But in telecom, that's the legacy. That's how it works. And you want a one API with global reach because your customers are global. You want to reach them wherever they are, and you don't want to have to think about uh, the method of how you're going to reach them. So you've been able to call your customers anywhere in the globe since 2009, right? And you guys have been doing that, and you've been growing your international usage of calling out to your customers all around the world since 2009, when we first launched our very first international product. But one of the things we think a lot about is what does it mean to launch a product and to put Twilio's name on it? What is the Twilio bar of quality? We know that you guys trust us with your applications, and you trust us to make them work. And we didn't think there would be any different bar of quality depending on where in the world you are. So we wanted to get this right first. So for the first three years of our company, we focused on the United States. We focused on North America. We wanted to make a great product. We wanted to make sure it was useful. We wanted to make sure that it scaled. We wanted to make sure that it was exactly what you needed. And we wanted to focus on the United States and our domestic market, the one that we knew really well, and build the company. And we wanted to build up our operational capacity, our on-call team, our 24 by 7 response team, our carrier operationalization, all these things we had to do. We had to make sure we did them right. And so we focused on North America to do that, because the quality uh, has to be paramount. That is a key thing for us. So earlier this year, we launched Twilio Global SMS, in July, in fact. And this was a really big undertaking. We had been working on making SMS a global product for two and a half years. 
And it turns out it's really hard to provide reliable global SMS. And so we invested a ton of time and we learned and we worked uh, with a lot of customers uh, and to figure out what was the right product that we would generally release to all of our customers and put the Twilio stamp uh, of approval on. But that time invested was well worth it. Two and a half years spent was well worth it because Twilio Global SMS works. And that is a hard feat to be able to reliably reach over 1,300 carriers around the world in over 180 countries is really hard. But we're really happy because it works, and that's when we call it GA. But a lot of it's in the details, too. For example, if you're trying to send a text message to a user in China, and so you send that message in Chinese, uh, before we did all of our optimizations, before we invested in our Unicode support, here's what you would have gotten. You would have gotten an empty message if you tried to send Chinese. But now that we've invested, you get an actual Chinese message. Same thing with Arabic. We invested a lot of time on Unicode to make it so if you send an Arabic message, you actually get the message that was intended. Um, and believe it or not, emoji also <laughs> works. So you get no message. Carriers drop it on the floor, but now that we invested the time, you get an actual emoji message. Uh, so there's all sorts of things you can do. And by the way, this isn't you know, theoretical. We have invested more time than Google has with Google Voice in our uh, Unicode support for global SMS. Twilio global SMS works, and we're really proud of it. So another thing, phone numbers. We've been launching phone numbers. But again, let me talk about the bar of quality that Twilio has. We have a standard uh, of quality that, again, no matter where in the world you are, that quality bar should not change. And it's not as simple as just buying a phone number from, from, from some carrier around the world and, and pointing it at a, a data center in Virginia. <laughs> it's not quite that simple. We go through an extensive process when we work with a new carrier in a new region to make sure that these phone numbers are up to the Twilio qual, uh, quality bar. So first of all, we pick the carrier, we vet them, and then we do a lot of testing at the integration layer with that carrier. Then we run a private beta with a handful of select customers who are using that product. They're giving us feedback on it. They're saying, uh, do we have the right kinds of phone numbers in this country? Do we have them geographically distributed in the right places in the country? Because you know, we obviously don't know the whole world as well as we know the United States. Uh, and they're telling us about quality, and they're starting to build applications, and they're saying, uh, yes, this works the way we expect it to. And after we've gone through that private beta, and we've got a high degree of confidence that we've built the right product, and we've picked the right partner in that country, we release it as a public beta. And a public beta is when most people first see it. And we let more people, we let anyone in the community who signs up for that beta, once we open the doors, we let you test it out. We tell you it's beta, but it's really baked at that point. We're pretty sure that you're going to love it. But we still call it beta because we want to put a lot more usage through it. And we generally tell customers, you know, don't, you probably shouldn't go GA with your app. But we want you using it, we want you testing it, and we want your feedback. And only after we've gone through that public beta process do we call it generally available. Do we GA a country? So that's the process we go through. It takes about six months for every country till we get to the point where we say this is Twilio quality. And only then can it carry the Twilio logo. So last year at this time, we were in two countries on one continent, United States and Canada. Then late last year after TwilioCon, we launched the United Kingdom. Uh, and that was very exciting. That was our first step off of the North American shore. And we launched the UK late last year. Uh, and then throughout this year, we've been launching more European countries. We launched 17 European countries this year. But today, I'm excited to announce that as of today, we are adding 20 more countries to the Twilio platform on four more continents. We have gone through that quality process now with a total of 40 countries on every continent in the world that's human populated. And we are really excited now that we can truly uh, fulfill to the next step our vision of one API with global reach. So let me show you a little quickly uh, some of the countries. There's a lot of them in North America, Canada, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Mexico, Puerto Rico, the United States. Uh, in South America, we've added Brazil and Peru. Um, in uh, Europe, the list is, uh, I'm not even going to read it because it just keeps going. Uh, but you can keep track and you can go to our website and you can find the full list there. Um, 
And uh, now we've added service in Asia Pacific. In Asia, we've got Hong Kong and Japan. Uh, in Oceania, we've got Australia and New Zealand, the entire continent coverage, I believe. Uh, in Africa and the Middle East, uh, we've got Bahrain, Israel, and South Africa live. So we are really covering the globe. And we're listening to you, listening to where you want coverage, and then we're working to build up that quality product. Really excited about this. But one of the things that uh, you have to do when you expand globally, and this is a really challenging part, is you have to understand the local laws and regulations, because every country has different telecom laws. And so not only does Twilio have to abide by those laws, but so do you. And so do your end users, right? We have to make sure that everybody is doing the right thing, because the worst thing would be to happen is for a government to come in and say, hey, this isn't compliant. And so what we've actually done is in every country we go to, we research the local telecom law, and what we've built into Twilio is a workflow showing you in every country what you need to do to be compliant with local laws. And it's built into the user interface and the API to make sure that when you build applications, that you know what the laws are and you are uh, abiding by them. And that's a significant amount of work, but it's all designed to help you build applications that are global in nature. There's another interesting thing about going global and having one API with global reach that we found after uh, this expansion that we've been working on for over two years. There's a pesky little thing. It's called the speed of light. Speed of light becomes your enemy when you are trying to be one API with global reach. See, here's the problem. If you do a phone call from, say, Sydney to Virginia, it'll typically traverse a number of teleco pipes, it'll do an undersea cable, it'll go across the country. That's a typical long-distance phone call in the old world of telecom. And when you do a local call, uh, let's say uh, you know, you've got two people who are both located in Sydney, and you call your next-door neighbor, well, that's simple. It just goes to the local carrier. Very easy. But the problem is, when you're operating a cloud product like Twilio does, and you're operating that infrastructure in the cloud in data centers, you don't have the advantage of the, uh, local, uh, the local nature of telecom as it exists because of its legacy. It's not comprised of thousands of little local carriers. It's one giant global network. So if you were to have someone in Sydney call their next door neighbor in Sydney, and that call goes from Sydney to Japan to San Francisco to the data center in Virginia, and goes back the way it came, that call just traversed about 30,000 miles around the globe and back just to call your next door neighbor. And despite the fact that the cloud has many advantages, this wasn't one of them. So today we're introducing that we've invested a lot of time, engineering, and energy in building a technique and a technology that we call global low latency. This is an approach that we've been using, and we've built a lot of software. What it is, is we've got currently six global points of presence spread around the world. And we use these six global points of presence to route every single call optimally to make sure that the, the media of that call goes through the shortest number of hops and the shortest uh, distance around the globe so that the calling experience is great. No matter uh, where you are in the world, you get a great experience, a great low latency call. But you'd say, well, you know, this isn't that hard, right? It's, uh, you, know, you know where the call is and you can just route it. It's not that hard. But the problem is Twilio is in a dumb phone. Twilio has a whole application stack. In fact, Twilio has no idea when your call begins where it's going to end. Because you write applications that interact with databases and do all sorts of things. And so we have no idea. So what we have to do is regardless of the business logic of your application, Twilio has to do the right thing. And that's what global low latency does. It's constantly route your call in the optimal path around the world to make it so your callers have a local call experience. And this is really hard. But we've invested a lot of time and energy in it. We're really proud of it. So you know what? To test it out, we sent one of our engineers down to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and we had him call someone local in, in, in Sao Paulo. We had him call her. And what, he, what we had him do was read off digits. One, two, three, four. Very exciting. Life of an engineer doing audio testing. So we had him read off these digits, and then we had a person on the other end, also in Sao Paulo, reply back when they heard the number. It's a way of testing the latency between those two. So let me show you uh, what it looks like. This is the audio sample, and we're going to play the audio of what happened when we did this test. One, 
One. Two. Two. Three. Three. All right, very simple. You get it, right? So now, what we did is we tested it both ways. We tested it with global low latency, and we tested it without global low latency if you didn't invest in this infrastructure. And here's what we found. One. 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 Two. 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 Three. 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 We found that consistently, if you did not invest in the optimizations that we've made, you had a more than 500 millisecond difference between those two calls. And 500 milliseconds might not sound like a lot, so I'll phrase it differently, half a second of difference. And half a second makes a huge deal when two human beings are trying to converse with each other. And so that's global low latency. And that is now live, working silently behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything. You get it for free. It just works magically behind the scenes. So we're really excited to be launching global low latency for all these phone numbers that we're launching around the world. So that's it. That's what we've been working on. We've brought you a lot of stuff today. We've brought you the partner program uh, to help you grow your business. We've brought you test credentials to help you build your apps. We've got the usage API and usage triggers. We've got premium support to help support you with those, uh, with those applications. We added WebRTC to Twilio Client. We added SIP, and we added 20 more countries to our global expansion. We're listening to you. We're helping you build applications. We're helping you focus on your user. This is the point. We're listening. We're building. Together, let's go do it. We can't wait to see what you guys build with all of this new stuff. Thank you.